Well, good morning to everybody in the building on a bit of a rainy morning, and to everybody watching online as well. Welcome to our service this morning. If you are new with us and you're in the room, please reach down beside you. There's a card there. We'd love to get some information. You can just drop that off at the office. And if you're online with us for the first time, we would love to connect with you at guest at calvary.on.ca. So uh, send us a message and we would love to connect with you later this week. Just a couple of announcements this morning. We are heading into week three, our last week of Spark Camp. You are all clearly not as excited as I am <laughs> about that. Uh, it's been a great, great two weeks and, and our week of VBS. We want to thank all the volunteers, of course, who have helped make it possible. It has been full. It has been uh, a lot of fun for our kids, and uh, we are super excited. Also, we want to join with some of our Calvary families, congratulate them on some births. Congratulations to the Hicks family, uh, Mike and Christine, on the birth of their daughter, Audrey Christine, and to Andrew and Jessica Gray on the birth of their daughter, Aveline Rosalie. So it is baby day today, and I believe Pastor Steve has some baby dedications for us. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Uh, I'm going to invite a couple families to come down and join me. Um, it's great to have uh, the Worsfold family and the Vasilev family uh, bringing their children. Um, we have Azariah here and little Pearl and uh, beautiful little children, and I just thought I would start just to make sure everybody kind of understands uh, what we're doing here this morning. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, here at Calvary, we have family dedications. And what this really means is moms and dads uh, making a commitment to dedicate themselves to the mission of the gospel, the mission of raising their children to uh, come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We believe that the scriptures teach us that as individuals, we need to come to a personal knowledge and experience and make that personal choice to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on your own. And so we don't baptize babies here, but instead we dedicate families. And then together we pray and we serve and we work and we commit to each other that we will do all that we can to put these precious children, Pearl and Azariah, in, in the front and center of all that they could experience to come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And so that's what today is all about. Uh, that's what this dedication service is all about. And so uh, for you parents here this morning, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment uh, before the Lord and with the congregation here in terms of that mission. And then in a moment, I'm going to invite the congregation to stand uh, and together that we will make a commitment with you as well. Believing that your child is a gift from God and that he shall hold you accountable for him and for her, do you now solemnly confess that it is your purpose to dedicate your child to the Lord and to his service. Will you pray with them and for them? Will you instruct them faithfully in the scriptures and teach them to read the word of God and to pray? Will you take her and him faithfully to worship services and do all that you can to bring your child to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and then teach them how to live a holy life? Is, if this is your commitment, would you please respond, we will. I'm going to invite the congregation to stand and together we know that this, this journey of faith, that this mission we on is a family ordeal, not just for these families at the front, but for us as a church family. And so this morning we are asking you as, as individuals, as teachers, uh, as uh, followers of Christ, um, as spiritual grandparents and so on, to make a commitment to stand with these families. So I'm going to read a statement and similarly ask you to make a commitment with these families. Believing that these children are a gift from God to this church and that God will hold us accountable for these children, do we solemnly confess that it's our intention to pray for them and to instruct them faithfully in the word of God and to live consistent Christ-honoring lives in order to point these children to Jesus Christ through our authentic examples. If this is our commitment, would you respond, we will? We will. 
Now, I had the opportunity to briefly meet these two beautiful children. I'm going to try this. Pastor Rick is a, is a master at this. I have a little grandfather experience. We'll see what we can do here. There we go. What beautiful children here. And now they can't see their parents, but we'll see how that works. So we've got Pearl and Azariah here. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this, this beautiful moment that we have as a church family to set aside time with moms and dads to agree together that we will intentionally do all that we can to raise our children, to come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior, Lord. Father, we know that in this world that there is trouble, there is distraction, there is, there is so much that is against us, but we know that you are for us. And that this is something that you have ordained, that you want these children to come to learn to know about you. And so we pray for Caitlin and Heward. And we pray for Vasil and for Stephanie, Lord, that you will give them wisdom and that you'll give them great discretion and patience. And Lord, that together as we partner with them here at Calvary and, uh, and, and the connections that they will have abroad from here as well, Lord, we pray that you will do your work, your special work in and through us, that these beautiful children would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And we ask this in your holy name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And together we say, Amen. I'll give you, I'll get a card for you, okay? Thanks, you guys.
church. Amen. You may be seated. 
let us continue to worship together as we join our hearts together in prayer before our Lord. Father, we love you, and we just want to declare right now how amazing and awesome you are. How wonderful is your name, the name that we can call on at this very moment during any situation we may face. You are there. You will not leave us or forsake us. That is your promise to us. God, we love you. We just thank you that we can worship you, that we can serve you, that we can draw close to you even here today. So God, as we come here today on this day to worship and praise and to draw closer to you, we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds so that we can see you more clearly, that you would draw us in. Will you help us to see the pitfalls in our lives, the, the footholds that we may have stepped in? May they become clear to us this morning, and we know by the declaration of your word, God, that we can be set free, set free in this place here today. So God, I want to ask that in the name of Jesus, that you would break people free from sin and the dominion of, of evil. And we know that Pastor Jim is going to come very soon, and he is going to preach an amazing sermon, God. So I just pray that every word would be your word. And I pray that you would be with Pastor Jim as he declares your word faithfully as he does. And God, we just look forward to how your word will be applied to our lives today, this afternoon, this week, as you set up divine appointments for us, as we have moments to meet with you through our prayer time, God, where you, you will situate things the right way. God, we believe on that this morning. God, I pray for someone who is here or any person who has walked in here today that may be far from you and just thinking, maybe I'll come to church today. I pray, God, that you would draw close to them. I pray that you would draw them in, that you would help them to see that without you, there is no hope. You are the Prince of Peace, the wonderful counselor, the one that we need each and every day. So God, we declare that as a church. We declare that as individual followers, and we know that you will do what you need to do. So God, please have your way. Please come and minister to us this morning by the power of your word and the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, this morning, we just want to give thanks for the amazing programs that have been running over the last month uh, with children's ministry and youth ministry and just various ministries that have been happening. Kids and teens have been coming into these buildings and the leaders and the, the pastors have been working very hard to present your gospel, God, and we just want to, we just want to thank you. Right now, God, thank you for what you do. Thank you for bringing these kids in. Thank you for sustaining these leaders when it's a, it, it can be an overwhelming day. Thank you for giving the gospel to us to be able to share to these kids. And thank you for the kids that came to know you over the last few weeks. We got one more week left. I pray for a great encouragement and great strength over our leaders. And, and I just pray, God, that you would just be with them as they minister starting again tomorrow and through this next week. Father, we know that we can call on you for anything and, and for anyone, and this morning I want to bring by name Guy and Alex and Tom and Sue and Jen and Karen and Roy and Linda. God, each of these people have things that they need, and you know them, you know the hairs upon their head, you know every person, and that's just a small representation of a bigger, a bigger number that may need you here today. So God, we pray for them, and we pray for those who, who may be in our congregation this morning, or maybe those who are, are tuning in online, that you would meet their needs, whether that is physical or emotional, mental, spiritual, financial, God, we know that we can turn to you. So I pray for them this morning. I want to say congratulations and just thank you, God. We love, love, love babies. We love when babies come to term. We love celebrating new life. So we want to just thank you, Jesus, for Mike and Christine Hicks on the birth of their daughter, Audrey Christine, and another baby daughter, another girl, Audrey, Andrew and Jessica Grace, birth of their daughter, Avalyn Roslin. God, we just thank you for those two uh, new, new little ones. We pray that you would keep them safe, and as they come to our church and our family, that we would raise them together, uh, uh, presenting the gospel to them and praying for their parents, as those parents, as they, they minister the, the good news to their kids. And Father, we just pray for Tim Bahula this morning. ABWE is his organization, our global partner, we know Tim does great ministry, he does great things, and we just pray for him this morning, we put him up before you, just encourage him, equip him, help him, help him to do his ministry faithfully to you. We pray for our mission agency, The Refuge, we pray for their great event they had on the weekend, I heard some great stories about that, we just thank you that they were able to be in the community and raising money, and how they're helping teens on the streets. God, we pray for Ukraine this morning as they continue to uh, face uh, face war and, and just brokenness every day. We as, as 
as Christians want to pray for our brothers over there and in Russia as well, we, we pray for both sides. We pray for those people. We pray for safety over them. And God, we just want to tell you this morning, once again, as in a few moments, we will stand and we will worship you with full song and full heart. You're an amazing God. There is none like you. And it would be a sin for us to miss out on the closeness, how close you are this morning. So God, help us be free of distractions so that we can minister, be ministered by you. We love you so deeply. We give these things to you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite us to stand together once again as we continue in song to worship our great King, remembering who He is and what He has done for us this morning.
As I was preparing for this morning's message, I started to look at some surveys about the most common things that people are worried about. And, well, some of them were on the list that you'd expect, things like health and parenting, things like relationships. There were some other things that were on the list that I was a little surprised in a top list of things that people worry about. Some were lying awake at night, but wondering whether uh, their sense of style was good enough and whether they had too many wrinkles. Just reading that now, I don't know if they mean themselves or their clothes. (laughs) Their clothes, okay. And well, I have learned in my research that there is a wide variety. There's a, 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 a wide gamut of things that people worry about. The top three that made the list every single time were three things. Money, death, and job security. Money, death, and job security. And these are really real concerns for people. People, as you're, if you've ever had that restless soul, you know that that can be, those are some pretty serious issues. They cause stress, But I find it interesting that two of the top three, the money and the job security, tie directly to how we're going to live here on earth. And while there are things that happen in situations that arise that should cause a little bit of anxiety, you're in the middle of a street, you see a bus coming at you, you should have a little anxiety in that moment. What we are starting to see is that the lifestyle of worry is becoming more and more common. And it's not really that hard to understand because there's wars going on right now that we pray are gonna end soon. And until they do, we pray that they're at least gonna be contained. Interest rates are going up. There's shortages that we have on microchips. They're making technology hard to get. Can't really find too many new cars right now. And when you do, it costs you a second mortgage to fill it with gas. <laughs> but as we continue through the Sermon on the Mount this morning, we're going to find that Jesus addresses some specific worries that his disciples had. And he tells his followers that there is an antidote for what ails them. And if you'll turn with me to Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34, we're going to work through the text, and I want to do so with this question in mind this morning. The question is, how are God's people to live distinctly in the midst of all of this worry? How are we to live distinctly in the midst of it all? So let's have a look at the text, starting Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? 
For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that this morning you've brought us together to hear the words that Jesus said to his disciples, words that he gave them to calm their souls and their worries. And Lord, I pray that for all of us who have come in today, that your word will take root in our hearts. So give us ears to listen and hearts ready to receive what your living word will do for us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the principle that Jesus is laying out here is this. It's found right in the first part of verse 25, and it says, do not be worried about your life. Perfect. That's it, I guess, this morning. Just stop worrying. I guess we can go, but we can't because Jesus kept talking. What Jesus is pointing to here is that when you have a genuine relationship with God, you no longer need to worry. You might worry, but you don't need to do it anymore. We could be freed from the stressful hours and the restless nights that we have as we lie awake with our minds just racing about the things that are troubling us. So what does it mean to worry? And the commentary R.T. France, I think, gives a very good definition for what Jesus is talking about here. The definition he gives is that worry is to have anxiety based upon perceived or real impending misfortunes. Okay, now let's note what this definition is saying here. Because what it's saying is that worry in this context stems from what may or may not happen. We're thinking ahead. We're it's about what could be coming. It's a state of mind <clears throat> where we become overly concerned with future events that either will or won't. They're either going to happen or they won't happen. And when we hear the word anxiety right now, anxiety is a hot topic in our culture right now. A StatsCan study of 2021 suggests that one in four Canadians is wrestling with anxiety or depression. One in four. That's a lot. And that is a major issue. But if we're going to look at what Jesus is saying in these verses, we have to look at it through the lens that Jesus intended. In these verses, Jesus is not painting here with a wide brush. He is not talking about all anxiety. He is talking about a particular kind. He's talking about provision. Now certainly there's some crossover here, and as we hear these things, they're going to cross over into other areas, but Jesus is specifically talking to his disciples right after, as we heard last week, he was talking about storing your treasures up in heaven, not worrying about your ones here on earth, and the disciples are concerned because now they need to shift the way that they're thinking. They had to shift their way of thinking from, okay, I've got to focus on what's on earth to now I've got to focus to what's on heaven. And so for us to understand what Jesus is saying, we have to recognize that the passage on wealth that we heard last week and today's passage, they're absolutely connected to one another. Here's how we know the context of that. In verse 25, it starts with, therefore I tell you. Another way to word that is, or for this reason, I say to you. In seminary, they teach you. If you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what's it there for? You have to go backwards. So for what reason is he talking about here? Well, he just talked to them about money. And the disciples, their anxiety is tied to their concern over how they're going to live on earth. Jesus has told them they can't serve both God and money. He just said that. And we see that not just from what we heard last week, but you see that throughout Scripture. And of course, Jesus knew exactly what the disciples were thinking. They're sitting there saying, okay, well, based off of what Jesus just told us about only focusing on the things of heaven, 
If I do as he's commanded and I focus on God as my master and I place my security in the things of heaven, then who is going to take care of me here on earth? That's what they're thinking. And Jesus knew that. And since he had just told them that they were not to worship money, now what he's saying is, yes, you don't need to worship money, but you also don't need to worry about it either. So he's not talking about, in this passage, all forms of anxiety as we know it. What he is talking about, we'll keep reading verse 25. So he says, do not worry. Well, worry about what? He says right there about your life. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you'll wear. And then he asks him a question. He says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? See what he's doing? He's tying back again their focus. He's saying, when you are focused on the things of God, you don't need to worry. But are you focused there or are you focused here? Which one is it? And before we're too hard on the disciples, remember, this was a major shift for them. This, wasn't, this is all brand new to them. <clears throat> These guys, up to that point, had an existence of survival. They were scroungers. And they were survivors. So to totally give up everything to God is going to be a major, major shift. But it's not one that's unfamiliar. Because we have to take the same giant leap of faith. And he says in the second part of verse 25 that life is more than just food and clothing. So what they have to do is they have to not just shift their focus to the things of heaven. Now they need to practically apply that and shift their trust there too. So Jesus is going to use a couple of analogies. We're going to see them in verses 26 to 30. And for these analogies, he's going to pull from creation, because he's going to say, all right, let me explain how this principle is going to work for you. In the first analogy, Jesus is going to use birds as examples. Starting in verse 26, he says to the disciples, look at the birds. And I'm going to paraphrase this, but he says, they aren't storing up their treasures on earth, those birds. They aren't stockpiling worms somewhere. You're not seeing another new storage facility, which, by the way, in this city, I can't believe how many storage facilities we have now. But you're not seeing new storage facilities pop up all over the tree for new places for the birds to keep their stuff. No, they're not doing that. But you know what? They still eat. The birds are still eating. Why? He says to them, because your heavenly Father feeds them. There's a subtlety in that. Don't miss this. He doesn't say because their heavenly father. Speaking of the birds. He says to them because your heavenly father. That's a distinction that's being made. That points to the disciples. Or points to the disciples. That there is a very special relationship between us and God. And there is. There's a very special relationship that we have in creation. Remember, they asked him how to pray. How did Jesus start the Lord's Prayer? Our Father. Focus on who we're talking about here as our provider. We're talking about our Father in heaven. And the second part of the verse brings home the point. He says, aren't you much more valuable than they are? So the first thing we have to realize is that we are image bearers. We are made in the image of God, and there is a special place for that. We are more valuable than the birds. <clears throat> Remember Genesis chapter 1? Verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, so that they may do what? Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air. That's showing where our place is next to the birds. And if God's going to take care of the birds and we're much more valuable than the birds are, then it stands to reason as we worry about these things that God is able and will take care of us. And if we know that, 
then we can, ha- we can start to shift our trust there. We can start to move our trust. Why can he completely provide? Because he is completely sovereign. He is sovereign over all. Even the feeding of a bird is reliant on him. All of it. How we understand God's sovereignty over everything is a key factor in how we're going to handle our worry and our anxiety. When we recognize that our provision is in the hands of the one who controls it all, we should rest better. That's a good feeling. So that feeling that leaves us restless and anxious and worried about what's, what are we going to do? As we feel overwhelmed and we feel insecure, it should suddenly be replaced with security because God's got it. It's all under his control. And whatever his will is, it serves a purpose. And this is the hard part for me. It serves a purpose even when we don't understand it or maybe we don't agree with it. But another thing that we need to remember from the birds is, well, that, well, well worry is prohibited here. Work is not. Work is not prohibited. What's that saying? Who gets the worm? The early bird. Not the one sleeping in. The active one. Birds still forage for food. Want me to prove it to you? Go down to the lake, grab some french fries. Seagulls appear out of nowhere. They're looking for food. As you're driving along, look up. You'll see hawks circling. What are they looking for? Food. As one commentator said, and I, I love this quote, he says, I've never yet seen worms rain out of the sky into an open beak of a bird. But you know what? We have seen food rain from the sky before, haven't we? Exodus 16. The Israelites, manna. God says, I'm going to make food rain down. But listen to, what, listen to the verse. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, I'll rain down bread from heaven for you. What comes next? The people are to go and gather. It doesn't just say sit there. They have to actually go and do something. And while the birds must still work for their food, they do it knowing that the food that they're looking for is going to be there. They don't know why. We have an advantage. God is, we know he's there. But we have to never, ever, ever take an approach where we're inactive in this. We have to be active. One of the things that is actually shown to increase our level of anxiety is idleness. When I wake up at four in the morning, which by the way, the irony was not lost on me that I woke up in the four or four in the morning worrying about a sermon about not worrying. (laughs) Sanctified on the spot. But when I get worried about something, I go for a walk. I just walk. I don't even really know where I'm going. I just go until I don't want to walk anymore. But in that walk, my mind is starting to process. It's starting to deal with these things. It's starting to handle what's going on. When I stay at home, here's what happens instead. I start catastrophizing. I go worst case scenario on everything. Everything. I have come up with some of the most creative scenarios in my own mind when I'm worried. We don't have to do that. Because that is when the cycle of worry starts. And in verse 27, Jesus asks the disciples another question. This one's, this one's a tough one sometimes because he says, Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? What he's saying is that anxiety achieves nothing. It only has negative impacts for the believer when we're worried about these things. As our stress levels rise, so do our blood pressures, so do our heart rate. Those are just short term. Long term, hypertension, heart attacks, strokes. So when we truly get and we, we, we recognize that 
in our mind and in our body and in our soul that our provision comes from God and that he has perfect purposes, the anxiety will start to come down because he's got it. Our soul will settle. I saw this played out magnificently just recently. About three weeks ago, my dad passed away. Now, my dad had a fistula, which was like a tear. And for all the doctors and nurses in here, I might get this wrong, so don't yell at me later. I just know that it impacted the way he could, provide, he could process food. And eventually, he just couldn't process the food anymore. And there was nothing left to do. So they moved him into palliative care. And uh, he knew his time was coming to an end. And I got to have a great conversation with him one day. And I said... And I used to ask him over the last few years, I would say, Dad, how's your heart? How's your soul? How are you feeling? This particular time, thinking about what I would do in his shoes, I asked him a question. I said, are you worried, Dad? And he looked up and he said, why? Why would I be worried? What's it going to do? My dad just says, God has a plan. And you know what? At the end of this, I'm going to be with him. So let his purposes go. And I praise the Lord that he gave my dad that. I praise him for that. And I praise him that he gave me the example to follow when I'm in trouble. It serves a great reminder that if we take that verse, the words of verse 27 and we apply them to our lives, it has an unbelievably practical and soothing effect on our worry. Now, the second example in verses 28 to 30, he's going to shift now. He's going to talk about something different, no longer the birds, not about the food, but now he's going to talk because the disciples were worried about, well, what are we going to wear? How are we going to provide even for our clothes? So Jesus, I can just picture him standing, talking to them, and there's fields around him. And he points back, and he's going to use these fields to help them show how capable God is for provision. In verse 28, he says, why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the fields grow? They don't labor or spin. As he's done with the analogy of the birds here, he's going to move from lesser to greater. The lesser were the birds, the greater is us. The lesser is the grass, the greater is us. As we're more to God than the birds, so we are to the, to the lilies in this case. And now in this case, there's a big difference between the birds and the grass, and, and Jesus says it, because the grass doesn't do anything. I mean, the birds just fly around, but the grass does nothing. He says it's just going to be harvested and thrown into the fire. That's not advocating idleness. Don't misunderstand what this is. Jesus is not saying, be like the grass. He's saying, pay attention to the one who's clothed them. That's what he's saying, who's clothed the grass. Pay attention. Jesus is again seeing the disciples worried. How are we going to provide? What's going to happen? How? He's answering that question. And this example the faith that he's going to challenge them on is referring to their practical reliance on God's provision again. Remember that. They're like, but what about this? And he's like, what about our clothes? He's saying, stop. This is not about eternal saving faith it's talking about here. It's rather about a simple belief that God will take care of their simple needs. He's calling them out because despite what they see around them, even in the blades of grass, even in the flowers, they're questioning whether God will provide for them. Go back to Genesis again. Adam and Eve, banished from the garden. What does God do? Close them. It's like the first thing. The truth is the disciples had spent a lifetime relying on their own efforts. And they were barely squeaking by, and Jesus is saying that the lilies are so beautiful that they scream out God's amazing care for them. They're just screaming it out. Don't miss it, he's saying. We have to remember that God's creation far exceeds human efforts at achieving splendor. There's a Canadian version of this. Again, I'm totally paraphrasing. But the Canadian version would go something like this. 
Have you ever seen a snowflake up close? Check these guys out. They're beautiful. In their design, they're incredible. In their uniqueness, it's vast. When they're combined, it's either a beautiful winter wonderland or a backbreaking labor. But think about that. Each one of those snowflakes, beautifully designed. And what's going to happen to each one of them? They're going to melt away. That's exactly what Jesus is saying about the grass here. He says to the disciples, not even Solomon. Now Solomon was a king who was known for his wealth, his resources, and his riches. He says not even Solomon could compare to this. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry. God's handiwork for something so temporary is so beautiful. How much more is it for us? As people who know that we have a heavenly father... We've been given freedom from these worries. And the next two verses are going to call us out to live in a way that is different from the rest of the world. So in verses 31 and 32, he's just given them the examples, and now he says, if the faith that Jesus is talking about here is simply recognizing that God will provide, then what the disciples are lacking in their understanding is they don't really recognize what God is going to do for them. They're not trusting him. That's why he says, ye of little faith, you of little faith. That is an admonishment. It is an admonishment out of love for his disciples. He's saying to them, you of little faith. And we hear that through scripture. This is the first one recorded in Matthew. But we're going to see, you'll see other ones. When they all occur, when, they fit, when the disciples fail to trust Jesus for meeting their physical needs. They were in a storm. They're panicking. Who's going to provide for us? Jesus comes up. There's a storm. Ah, Jesus goes, okay, here, it's calm. We all good now? Like, I mean, they didn't get who they were with. When Peter was walking on the water, and he was doing just great until he did what? Took his eyes off of Jesus, and then, and then he fell because he turned to self-reliance again. And the truth is, sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, when we look at what God's provided for us, we simply don't want it. I saw an amazing example of that last week. Spark Camp, we presented the gospel to 90 kids last week, and I had two tables in front of me. On one table, I had this little round table. It had a cross on it. On the other table, I put all sorts of stuff. I put an iPad that was working. I put some AirBuds or some AirPods in there. Uh, I put 100 bucks on there, threw some candy and some chocolate on for good measure, and then threw a VR headset Boom. And I looked at the kids. Oh, and there was a beautiful reclining leather comfortable chair there. And I said to the kids, which one do you want? And they all said, that one. Of course they did. And then I presented the gospel to them and I explained that to them. And as God moved, and I looked up and I said, after it was over, I said, so now which one do you want? Well, I give God all the praise and glory as the kids who said, no, we've shifted our focus. This is where we're going. There was a stunning visual. And it was of kids standing up, pointing at this table and saying, but I want that. I don't care. I don't, I don't want that. I want that. Knowing what God has given us, sometimes we just don't want it. So God gives us exactly what we need but then we decide that we're going to ignore it or we're going to try to improve it in some way. And sometimes when God provides for, it, we don't, or provides for us, we don't acknowledge it, we grumble. That's exactly what the Israelites did in Egypt, right? The manna rained and then rained some more and then there was more manna and more manna. And what did they do? We want something else. We grumble sometimes. They, they complained because it wasn't what they wanted. But we're called to God's mission, so we are called to be distinct. That's the whole point. And there are times when we treat God as though he's the one who's going to stockpile our warehouses for our own ideas and our own misguided ambition, which is almost always the things that we want. And this is where we think that we know our situation better than God. 
This is where emotions that cause worry happen. This is where we envy. This is when we look at people's lives and say, how come theirs is so easy and mine is so hard? How come they have that and I don't? We start to covet the things and the way that people live in their lifestyle. That's called materialism. That's what it is. It's misplacing our hope and our trust in the things that we, that we think we want because what we're really doing in that case is we are prescribing the cure for our worry to ourselves. We're not going to Jesus. We're not, Jesus says, you don't need to worry. Focus on the things of heaven. We go, or maybe this will work. If I can just improve my earthly situation, maybe the worry will dissipate. Maybe it'll go away. But this is where the problem comes in. Because as soon as we say, if I get more money, I don't have to worry. Or if I get that promotion, I won't have to worry. Or if I just move, I won't have to worry. Or fill in the blank. It doesn't fix everything. Because you know what happens when we get more money? We spend more money. And then our lifestyle changes. And then we become addicted to our lifestyle. And now we're really in trouble because now we have a lifestyle that we can't afford and now we're really worried because now we have to give up the stuff that we want. Credit card companies love this. Buy now, pay later. And worry-free buying is only worry-free until the first payment comes due. And then it's worry. And we keep looking to add things to our collection and we keep searching and we say, if I just have this, it'll be fixed. If I just have this, it will be fixed. If I just have this, it will be fixed. And God says, stop it. You already have it. It's me. It's already there. I'm there. I've got this. Materialism results from no trust or no knowledge in God. That's where it comes from. Jesus is telling the disciples in verse 32 that, well, the Gentiles, and the Gentiles in this case are just people who live outside of that genuine relationship with God. They're going to run around and worry about these things. God's given them an escape route, and they're missing it. But if we recognize it, we have an escape route from worry, then disciples can live differently than the spiritual Gentiles of the world. That's the point. We're supposed to be distinct. We're supposed to be different. It's not about the money, it's about the one who provides it. This year I've been very thankful and blessed. I have a friend who has some pretty good t- tickets to go see some Jays games. We're pretty close behind home plate, right beside the visitor's dugout. I was there with a friend, and I'll tell you right now, if you, have, if you ever sit down there, you know all the really quiet people? Stop it. You have a responsibility to chirp at the other team. That's your job. You're there. Your job is to make them nervous, uncomfortable. So I was there. We were watching the Cincinnati Reds. Their catcher, a guy named Tyler Stevenson, comes into the on-deck circle. The guy I was with, knowing his role, starts to get into his head. It was around the second inning. And he says, hey, Tyler, I can't see. Get out of the way. This multi-millionaire player turned around and went, sorry, and then leaned down like this. (laughs) And every inning he came up, he'd swing, the pitch would come, he'd lean down like this. You You can't boo that guy. You can't. So I checked him out on social media after. First thing pinned to his social media. All I have is God. All I have is Jesus. Help me reflect him. That's what he's saying. It's a simple gesture, but this guy who has lots of it did not find his identity in his money. So as believers, how we handle situations is a testimony and reflection of how we view God. And it's either reflecting trust in him or it's not. We either trust God or we don't. Good news, because Jesus doesn't leave us just there. And in verse 33, he's going to give us the remedy. And the remedy is this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. 
Again, sounds simple, but let's break that out a little bit. It says to seek, to first seek his kingdom. What does that mean? Well, if we go back to the Lord's Prayer again, what it's really doing is it's our desire above all else to actively pursue what was prayed for in Matthew 5, 9, and 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a familiar verse. It's the Lord's Prayer, and as we, 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 it can sound wrote sometimes, but the implications when you pray that is profound. Because what we're praying for is that our thoughts and our actions are going to align with the will of God. That's what we're really praying for. Our thoughts are going to align with Him no matter what that looks like for us. No matter what it looks like. Another commentator writes that as we pray this prayer, what we're doing is we're willingly submitting to God's purposes to his plans, and to his glory. And I would add that that's the case even when we don't understand his plans, even when we don't agree with them. If God is our ultimate provider, we got to ask the question, then why are so many people struggling to pay their bills? And that's a really hard question to answer. I just know that it lies in God's purposes, but I know there's more to it than that too for some of us. Because what we really need to do is check our financial priorities. And did you see what he says? You're supposed to seek first. You first seek his kingdom. So ask yourself the questions. Are you generous with your money first? Are you more interested in investing in an investment portfolio or into the mission of God? Have you checked your heart as it relates to materialism? Are you willing to sacrifice the actual non-necessities in your life in order that you may glorify God for what he's given you? Are you really ready to do that? Are we willing to accept that God's plan for how he provides for us is good even when it's really difficult? Because when we don't, that's when we find ourselves restless and anxious and probably looking for the things that we want, not the things he's provided for us. Every morning, we need to wake up and remember that this isn't a hide and seek kind of seek the kingdom. It's not hidden from us. It's right there. Seeking the kingdom of God isn't looking for something that's hidden but what it is, is daily focusing on it. We have to daily focus on this, Lord, I submit to whatever you have given to me. I trust you. And we refocus our attention back to aligning with the will of God as we pray. That's what we're supposed to be doing every morning. So when you're praying or doing your devotionals, thy, will, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That requires discipline and intentionality. And yeah, that's what we have to do. It's a discipline and it's intentional, but it's absolutely essential. It's part of the prescription. And so the second part of this, he says to seek his righteousness. So if the first one is coming into alignment with how he's thinking, now the second part is now actually do it. It's great to know it, but now actually live it out. Actually do it. Once we've submitted to the authority that we've seen and the plan that God has and willing to accept all of that, now we actually get to live that out. And we have to do that in a way that honors God, not in a way that honors ourselves. And if you go back to, verse, or to chapter 5, verse 20, we're going to see that God ha or that Jesus had called the disciples back then, you have to live distinctly from the Pharisees. You have to live distinctly. And this is one of those distinctions. There is a huge difference between self-righteousness, which is what the Pharisees were, look at me, versus righteousness that's pointing back to God, saying, look at what he's done. John Stott writes, in the end, there are only two kinds of piety, the self-centered and the God-centered. So there are only two kinds of ambitions. 
One can be ambitious either for oneself or for God. There is no third alternative. It's one or the other. This is the crux of the remedy. So when we understand that a commitment must be made to constantly find and do the will of God, aligning with his purpose, we're going to see results in the way that we worry. We really will. And the result is that when we put God first, material concern becomes unnecessary and distracting. I don't know why, but I find something really comforting in that. That the thing that I was lying awake at night that was leading me straight into a heart attack becomes nothing more than a little itch. Well, that's annoying. It's that moment when we say, but I want that. And you just, you remind yourself of this and you go, actually, I don't need to worry because God has it. I'm going to have what I need. Our thoughts might go to that place, but we have protection against it. God is bigger than our worry. And as we live this way, we reflect that kind of trust into the world. You actually get to show your trust to other people. And what's going to happen? Well, if you go back again to Matthew 5.10 and Matthew 5.16, it will tell you what's going to happen. The first in 5.10 says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of their righteousness. For theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. You're going to get people that really don't like the way that you live. Don't you want this? Not really. But don't you want this? I really don't. Because what happens is it convicts them. So they'd rather just keep living in their world and they're going to come after you. Verse 16 tells us a different story as well. It actually gives us the other option, which is in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It can actually help to show people the gospel and point them that way. That's great news. How we live really does matter. Finally, in verse 34, we see that Jesus is looking ahead. Jesus tells the disciples in verse 34 that there will be trouble ahead. So even though we have an antidote, it doesn't mean that there won't be worry. There will be worry, there will be troubles. But we don't need to worry. What it is saying is that worrying serves as a way to only multiply the problems when they come. Problems will come, but when we worry, it'll make it worse. There's a few final thoughts I have on that, and that is, one is, um, when we're overwhelmed by the things of tomorrow, what's coming, what's coming, what's coming, we completely can miss what he's doing today. When we're so focused on what may or may not happen, God's grace for today could go completely unnoticed. I know I don't want that. Because we're missing what he's doing that's right under our nose. That he deserves the glory for, that he deserves praise for. And I know that when we look back on our situations... When we can look backwards to them, you ever be able to say, I know God was there? I think many of us can do that. We can look back and say, that was horrible. I hated every minute of that situation, but man, I know God was there now, and I am so thankful that he was. Trust is doing that looking forward. If as we reflect back, we say, I know God was there, then trust is looking ahead and saying, I know he's going to be there. I don't need to worry. Because one thing that I can be sure of and I'm positive of is that tomorrow's tragedy may very well be next week's testimony. Or next month's. Or next year's. The worries are going to come. But in it, we get to glorify God through it. And that's amazing. So you look back on those situations and you say, what was I so worried about? God says, exactly, exactly. What were you so worried about? We just need to learn from it and we live it out as we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness 
knowing with confidence that God is going to provide all we need. Our souls that are restless can be settled. Our anxiety levels which rise can be quelled. There is a remedy. God is our provider. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning, and we thank you that as Jesus teaches the disciples as they were worried and anxious about who their provider was and where things came from, that you gave us that knowing that we would need to hear that as well. Lord, I know that there are so many things that are in the world right now that are troubling and that we worry about, but I pray for each one of us today that during this last time of worship together, that we'll bring those things to you. We'll think about those things that are troubling us. And Lord, we'll remember who we're worshiping. It's our Father who art in heaven. Amen. I'm going to invite us to stand together as we respond to God's word. and Let's sing together that hymn. As we think about what God has done for us, that we would say and sing it as well with my soul. Let's sing together. When peace like a
leave here saying, it is well with my soul. Knowing that we have a God who loves us, who is going to provide for us. There's three things that we can take from here to remember that we have victory over worry. Faith, trusting God to meet our needs. Father, knowing that he cares for his children. And first, putting God first in our lives so that he might be glorified. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that in these moments we know that we have a loving Father who we can turn to, who has provided for us all that we need. So Father, let us first seek your kingdom and your righteousness as we leave here today so that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.